Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Deacon Hoover Radio Network. And it's 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 flagship show, I'd like to think. I, the Deacon of Real Estate podcast with you, Alex Deacon. I'd like to think it's the flagship. If that's what you think, then that's that works for me, <laughs> brother. So, Alex, uh, today it looks like we're going to be talking about the seven common mistakes, uh, or seven things to avoid uh, when investing in real estate. Yes, and to be honest with you, I am completely winging this. I'm going to stop at number seven. There's probably 700 things to avoid when purchasing real estate, but people tend to tune in when it's it's only seven steps, and if I avoid those, then I'm going to make a gajillion dollars. So we'll start with numero uno. Do we know what numero uno is? Oh, would that be pre uh, be pre qualified? No, no. What's number one? Ah, good threw guess. Me, threw me a curveball. Wrongo. Okay, number one. This is, doesn't have to be number one. This is our number one. Does the property is the property going to be profitable? Ooh. Seems like a really simple duh question, right? Well, I just won't buy it. Well, how do you know if a property is going to be profitable or not going to be profitable? How do we know that, Adam? Uh, market research would be one. Uh, yeah, market gut research. instinct. A lot of times, just knowledge. Um, gut instinct does help, but that's at the bottom. That's towards the bottom of the list. Okay, so let's talk about: Is it going to make money? Are the rents accurate? So, everybody in uh, Radio Land or podcast, Bill. <laughs> Write this down. Like Are the rents accurate? So, oh, well, the landlord, the, the current owner said that the rents are this. Well, maybe you should see leases. How about that? Get copies of leases. Make sure that that is the market rent because in some cases what an owner will do is they will get their property rented for as much as they possibly can. It might take them a year to find a tenant. And then the numbers are skewed to look like the property is going to make a whole lot more money when in fact when you have a vacancy you're going to find a very difficult time getting that that amount of rent in a reasonable time period yeah you may be able to get 800 dollars a unit but if it takes you four months to rent it versus renting it for 700 a unit and renting it in two weeks at the end of the year you're going to make money more money at 700 than you are at 800 because your vacancy rate is going to be extremely high so long and short of it make sure the rents are accurate do your market research on rents um, number two, this is really 1B, so that's 1A, 1B. Make sure your expenses are what they, the owner says they are. And what do I mean by that? Well, what are the utility bills? What are the costs that they've set aside for repairs? What are the costs they've set aside for major expenditures like roof, furnaces, uh, sewer lines, things like that? Because there's a couple different ways you want to set aside money for repairs. First of all, just typical move in, move out. That's when people you know, move in. There's cost involved. When people move out. There's cost involved. There are you know carpet only has a certain amount of shelf life. There's painting that has to be done every x amount of years. But there's your big items too that you need to be aware of. That okay, say that roof is going to cost ten thousand dollars. The furnaces there's three furnaces in a three unit, and they're going to cost six thousand dollars to replace all three of them and what's another big one three hot water tanks just say another eight hundred dollars hot water tank um you could just go on and on add all these up let's say these all add up to fifty thousand dollars then you have to kind of take that fifty thousand and divide it by let's just say 20 years right so fifty thousand divided by 20 years is twenty five hundred a year yes Sound good? Yeah. 2500 a year. That means you should set aside for this particular building, this building we just made up, $200 per month for just those big items that are going to come up. You might not have to deal with them for 10 years, but year 11, you get slammed with a, a $10,000 roof and, and, and three furnaces. And it could all hit you at once. All hit you at once. So you have to account for that. So make sure you're using the correct repair numbers and those can be different depending on the property if the property is completely worn down and all the windows are bad and the roof has got about three years left and hot water tanks are old and the furnaces are old the sewer line's never been replaced it's an 80 year old um, building and it's terracotta pipe underground there's a lot of trees and roots uh, near where the sewer line is you have to set aside a whole lot more money 
for that building than you do if you bought a building that's five years old that's you know up the code it was built up the code five years ago and so on and so forth so you see where there is no rule of thumb and we've talked about the rule of thumb can yep. we throw it out the window yep so that's number one and and just ask and just to kind of piggyback real quick and when you were talking about especially uh, especially when you cost of rent you know, do you feel as though there's there's a lot of people that are either undervaluing their property and overvaluing their property? Because you know, you said definitely make sure that you're not renting somewhere asking for eight hundred dollars. You know, a home staying vacant for six months when you can have that stability of the six fifty or the seven hundred dollars. You know, mm-hmm. are there people on the other side too where they're not making it as profitable because they don't know the market area and they could be renting? You know, they could actually be renting for more than what they are. Oh sure, yeah. Okay. There's that's how that's how you can find a really good deal. Is if you if you come across a good quality property that's underperforming for a few different reasons, uh, the the landlord is just they're kind of complacent and they're happy with these tenants they've had in there forever, and they're okay with renting them for for twenty percent under market value. Mm-hmm. And if the agent who who lists the property, let's say they use the current numbers. And don't do a real good job at pricing it, and they undervalue it. They underprice it, but they price it based on the current income. Mm-hmm. But you know, because you're an educated investor, you know that those incomes should be twenty percent higher. Then, yeah, you want to jump on that building and maybe pay full price, maybe even more than full price, before somebody else gets it, yeah. because it's underperforming. It means, uh, and that's due to the landlord just not wanting to get uh, an increase in rents. Okay. okay? Good deal. So that's a good question. All right, number two, number number two um, common mistake you could say is uh, you need to know the market. Okay, what what does know the market mean? Well, we talked about knowing what the current rents are, knowing what your expenses are. That's part of the market, but knowing what things typically sell for in that market. Because if you're buying in an A class area, A being a really good school district, uh, really high average household income. If you're buying in an A area and you expect to pay B or C prices, you're sadly mistaken. You're never going to get anything. So when you're looking in an A area, know you're going to pay A prices. Know that your rate of return, your not necessarily the rate of return, but your general cash flow each month is probably going to be less. But on the flip side of that, you have a good stable property. You have uh, higher quality renters and you're going to get usually higher or a better appreciation than other areas. So there, there are trade-offs. So know your market. Know what you're going to have to pay. Of course, you want to pay as little as possible. That's the, the, the game in anything, I guess, when you're buying and selling, regardless of what it is. You want to buy as low as possible. But just know when you're when you're dealing with an A area, you're going to pay A prices. And you're, and you're dealing with a, a B or C or D area, just know that you need to be paying those B, C, or D prices. Oh. Okay, makes really? sense. Yeah, that would make sense. No, that does make sense. It does make sense. Really? It does make sense. I, I totally lost myself. I, I think no the, the one thing saying. I find interesting is I wonder how many people realize you know when it comes to neighborhoods A, B, C, or D like because you know how we always say people look at their own properties through rose colored glasses. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wonder how many uh, homeowners think that they live in an A. A neighborhood when it really isn't quite A or, or vice versa. You know, a lot of people think they live in a, a D or a C and it's really a little bit better than, you know. Yeah. So don't 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 always judge neighborhoods books by the covers. Okay. We'll take that with a grain of salt. Thank yeah, you. Right. Thank you for that. <laughs> hey, I do what I can. <laughs> All right, number three, numero three oh. Um, know what you know what you can afford. Okay. So maybe I wanna say get pre approved to get qualified, but you know, buy something within the realm of your finances. Don't look for a multi-million dollar 30-unit building for your first transaction. I think no. I just think that's a mistake. First of all, it's it's a lot of risk, especially if you don't know what you're doing. Second of all, there's a high, high probability that you're not going to be able to even get approved for any sort of loan. So the first thing you should do, even before you start looking at any properties... I mean, you can educate yourself and read books and listen to podcasts and do all that. But before you actually get out there and start looking and with the intention of buying, you need to talk to a good mortgage broker to find out how the bank's going to look at your finances and look at you in general and what you're going to be able to borrow. So if the bank tells you, you know what, everything looks good, 
Adam, we're going to let you borrow up to one hundred fifty thousand dollars for your investment, then you shouldn't be looking at properties that are two hundred or two fifty. Mm -hmm. So know what you can afford, know what the bank's going to lend you because that's going to basically dictate what you can go out and buy. And what I suggest doing is buying something for your first deal, small, low risk, uh, easy exit strategy, something like that, just in case because it's your first deal and you want to keep it that way. Right. So that's, that's number three. That is one thing that I noticed that we, we talk about and you, you absolutely talk about a lot for the first, you know, your first deal. Make it simple. Make it basic. Don't don't get don't get taken on your first on your first deal, um, because I think that's how a lot of people probably fall out of investing. They get bit once and then they never want to do it again. Absolutely. All right. Now, again, these aren't any sort of order, but uh, number four for me, I think, would be because I see a lot of people jump into partnerships. You know, Joe and, her, and his buddy Bob they're at the bar drinking. And they're like, Hey, you know what, dude? Let's just let's buy some real estate together. Because I want to be rich. All right, cool. Let's go into partnerships together. And you're friends, right? It's a great way to ruin a friendship. Yes. Because, was it Bob and Joe? I can't remember who it was. Bob and Joe. Okay, I think it was Bob and Joe. Bob was probably a little drunker than Joe. But Bob says, hey, buddy, let's do this. Joe says, yeah, let's do this. Okay. And then they go and buy something. They don't create an LLC. They don't have an operating agreement that's spelled out that says, okay, if if Joe dies or Bob dies, what happens? Who's the managing partner? Who's in charge of this? Who's in charge of that? Because what happens in most partnerships, and I don't want to, I don't want to get anybody afraid of being a partner with someone, but you you have to pick the right partners. And but what happens with most partnerships that go sour are, especially when the property doesn't make money, they go sour fast, and that's what happens. Cause you have two une uneducated partners. They buy a property that loses money. One partner feels like they're doing more work than the other, or the partners don't agree on how to repair something. Like, I might want to repair it this way. They want to repair it that way. Our budgets don't commingle. It's just, it can be an ugly mess. And when the property loses money, then it creates a massive amount of just stress and friction. So pick your partners wisely. If... You know, if Bob is uh, an accountant and Joe is a contractor, <clears throat> is that a good combination? It could be because, you know, someone can do the books and Joe can do the repairs. Right. Doesn't necessarily mean that's going to work out. When I choose my partners, I make sure that in most cases, because maybe I'm a control freak, but I know what I'm doing. So in most cases, now in my career, I want to be in charge of what's going on with the project. If you want to be my partner, come to the table bring the money or bring the deal yep. and let me handle it because we're going to make money together. So choose your partners wisely before you go out to a bar and, and put a deal together on a napkin. Maybe sleep on it. <laughs> maybe talk to an attorney first and talk it over with your significant other before you choose to jump in emotionally into a partnership. So think about it. There's a lot of friendships and families that have been torn apart by things of yeah, that nature. It's too many. All right, so that's number four. What would number five be? Let me think. What do you think, Adam? Can you pick a number five? Can I pick a number five? Yeah. Um, I mean, my favorite number five of all time is probably Jeff Bagwell from the Houston Astros, but that's neither here yeah, nor there. Yeah, that's totally um, relevant. Let's see. Uh, let me see. So, um, the I mean, I think the biggest one always, for at least for me, because I would be that that newbie. Mm -hmm. Is is always you know knowing what you can afford, um, but I guess uh, we already picked that. We one. already picked up that, on that one's one, picked. You know, so that we already. This is what we one. talked about so far. Just it, 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 for those of you who just tuned in. Yeah, here's a here's a good recap. You want to make sure okay. that the property is profitable. That, profitable. Yeah. Know your market. Know your market. Uh, make sure you can afford this property. and You're mm -hmm. not overextending yourself. And if you are going to go into a partnership, choose the right partner. And understand the partnership process as well. Yes. Don't just and jump we have, in and, and because I said seven, we have three more to go. We have three more to I go. I just don't know what they're going to be right this moment. So we're going to say, um, let me see, seven mistakes to avoid. Uh, forgetting your patience because it's still a patient game, correct? I mean, that's – or you're like, no, we're, that, we're jumping right in. When we're patience. <laughs> <laughs> patience is or was a virtue. I would it's say patient. number five, that's a good point. You have to be patient. Mm -hmm. So 
Number five, it, it, this is funny because you have to be patient, but you also have to be some super driven 